Good morning. Happy Friday. I hope your day is going well, and I hope your weekend is even better. Next Monday, when Tree comes to class at 1.10, uh, he will turn in and we'll talk about problem set number five. Quiz five is up. It's a regular quiz. It's not a take-home quiz. We'll uh, make sure you turn in the net ionics lab, which we did on Monday, and then we'll start the unknown chloride app. This lab is one of the labs you will need some goggles. Both this week's lab and next week's, the following week's lab, the calorimetry lab, uh, glasses will be needed. So if that happens. Any questions? pH is a really cool way for scientists to talk about how much acid, and as we'll see, and or base is present. And we're going to talk in Chem 221 mostly about how much H plus is present. But, um, spoiler alert, high acid means low base, and low acid, like this, means high base. So we've talked about how acids always have the H listed first. That's big time part of being an acid, and we'll start looking at this more. But for right now, just realize that if you see a number associated with pH, you can very quickly tell if it's acidic or basic. If that number is less than 7, it means it's an acid. If the pH number is greater than 7, it's going to be basic. And if it's around 7, equal to 7, that means it's going to be neutral. And we talked about different substances and stuff. Most of the foods and drinks we eat are a little bit acidic. Uh, most of the cleaners we use are more a little bit basic. So here's kind of a question you might see. Uh, you've got a cleaner. You test it for pH, which is not too difficult. You find it has a pH of 9.46. Does that make this cleaner acidic, basic, neutral? Yeah, it's probably a pain in the backside. I don't really like cleaning. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's not the right answer here. So what does 9.46 tell you? Yeah. Well, it's more than 7, so it's a basic solution. Basic solution. Well done, man. Yeah, that's right. So Ben and the rest of you then can quickly see that if that pH number is greater than 7, that means it's going to be basic. You bet. So it's just really a nice way. You don't have to think about something number times 10 to the something, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Literally, pH, uh, you can just look at that really quickly to tell. Now, to calculate pH, it's all uh, based around the hydronium ion concentration, the amount of H+. Sometimes you will see H plus listed as H3O plus, and they're the same thing, all right? So they both work. In this section, I'm going to primarily use H plus. In later sections, we'll talk more about the hydronium ion. But anyway, if you have a neutral solution, that of course means you have a pH of 7. So if you figure out uh, what the H plus is in that particular case, it comes out to be a number that's very well studied, 1.00 times 10 to the minus seventh moles per liter. It's room temperature. We'll talk about what happens later uh, when you change the temperature. But the way that they get then this seven number is you go minus log of the hydronium concentration. So high H plus is 1.00 times 10 to the minus 7. So minus log 1.00 times 10 to the minus 7 comes out to be 7 itself. Um, there are two types of logarithms, possibly on your calculator. You want to make sure that you're using what's called base 10 log, which is LOG. You might have uh, LN, which is a natural log on your calculator, but make sure that you use the base 10 log here. That's what all of these pH things are about. Soren Sorensen, I love his name, was the creator of the pH scale, and it's actually really handy. And in addition to pH scales, you can actually have P lots of other things. So like uh, I used to use a PCL scale, which was how much chloride was there. Very specific applications there, but it's, it, we'll talk about that more in Chem 223. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Is the base log the you have to look on your calculator to find that out. So yeah, uh, I can try to help you, but honestly, it's not my strong point. Do you have the LN button on your calculator? I'm trying to find it. <laughs> I see. Rory, Jacob, look at back there. Yeah, there are ways to do it. Thank you. Well done. 
Um, this would be a cool thing to know how to do, all right? Just like it's need to know how to go to scientific. No, no. <laughs> what happens in 1303 stays in 1303? Prop at back on. Uh, just like it's nice to know scientific notation to regular and vice versa, this is another cool thing to know and stuff. So. All right. Once in a while, you'll have weird numbers, and it says, uh, what is the pH? So in this case, we have a soda can, and we test the pH, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3 moles per liter. That's the moles of H plus in a liter of the soda. And that's obviously kind of a weird thing to use, so what is the pH? Well, pH is minus log of the H plus. So you can test it to make sure you've got the base 10 log, minus log of that number right there. It comes out to be 2.80, all right? Now, because it's soda, it's a little acidic. It's got kind of the sparkly stuff, so it should be a little bit acidic. Um, this is kind of a way to test yourself to make sure you're using the right logic. So here's another question. Let's say you had a concentration of a nitric acid solution, 0 0.030, and you wanted to know what the pH is. The strong acids, their concentrations equal the H+. Plus. So for this particular problem, what you can do is go minus base 10 log 0 0.030, right? Minus log 0 0.030. Now the pH number you get should be less than seven. This is an acid, it's not a base, all right? And if you do that, 1.52. Question. Once in a while, it's nice to go the opposite way. This is an example of a pH meter, and we'll use these in Chem 223. It has like a little probe. It measures the conductivity of the solution, specifically for H+. They're pretty cool little devices, but on a practical level, bam, how comes the pH? Well, maybe you want to know what the concentration in moles per liter, the molarity is of the H+. This is an example of going the opposite direction from a base 10 log. So in this case, pH is 3.12. 3.12 equals minus log of H+. Plus. So the first thing you want to do is put the minus on the other side. Uh, logarithms may not be something you do every day, <laughs> I understand, but to get rid of this base 10 log, you go 10 to the power of x. So if you go 10 to the log of h plus, the 10 to the power of log cancels out, and the h plus comes down right there. And you do, if you do it to the left, you have to do it to the right. So on the right side, you go 10 to the power of minus pH, and you're good to go. Now, even if you don't have an LOG button right there, you can still go 10 little caret, which is raised to the power of. Make sure you put the minus sign in there, minus 3.12. If you do it in this problem, 7.6 times 10 to the The idea of molarity mm -hmm. and pH, are they, are they exchangeable? Like, are they like equivalent to each other, the, the same, same thing, or a different way? Or are there, is there like an exchangeable difference between these yeah, uh, so anything with logs is based on powers of 10, all right? And 10 to the minus 4, you can see, relates to like a power of 3 here. So it's give or take a little bit and stuff. Um, it's not directly, like pH is a unitless uh, quantity, it's usually considered, but you can convert it back into molarity, which makes it cool for chemists and stuff. So just an easier way, David, to talk about it. You know, who wants to... I could say, hey Ben, I've got a 7.6 times 10 to the minus four molar solution. And Ben being smart said, say, okay, the neutral solutions are 10 to the minus seven. That's smaller than this. This must be acidic, but that sucks. <laughs> All right, so if I say, hey, I've got a 3.12 solution, it's easy to tell it's acidic. Good question. Other questions? All right, so that's it for this chapter on solutions. And you can see how Molarity, something we dealt with a lot. We'll do we'll do with it um, in the lab on Monday too. But the next section is quite interesting, and it's quite different from the other sections we've seen. We need to start thinking about like why reactions happen, and that only can be really explained through the discussion of energy. 
So thermal chemistry is chemistry when it's applied to thermodynamics. And thermodynamics is just energy studies and science. And chemistry uh, relies on thermal chemistry and thermodynamics. People don't always think about the energy component of reactions, but it actually has a lot of really cool uses. Um, if you ever seen fireworks, of course, probably have, and that's definitely a use of thermal chemistry. But we can also justify like why in the net ionics reaction, some of you felt the test tubes and they were warm. You'll also see that some reactions, when you touch them, they get cold. So this is kind of an interesting chapter. It's a different twist from a lot of other chemistry classes you might have had, but it is pretty cool stuff. If you take peanuts and you put them in boiling water, all right, uh, you can make them soft, but in this case, they're actually burning the peanuts. And you may not think about it, but when you take food or drink, uh, it makes sometimes it makes you feel good, right? It's the energy that's being released from those chemical bonds in the food. And you eat some peanuts, you know, it's like, all right, cool. Well, this is the manifestation of the energy in an external way from your body. You can actually get energy out of peanuts. This is similar to taking like a fuel, like gasoline and burning it. Uh, you get energy out. So if you can make water boil, that shows you're getting energy out of these things pretty cool. But instead of talking about peanuts burning, I much prefer the gummy bear. If we combine one gummy bear, which is composed mostly of sucrose, with molten potassium chlorate, a violent reaction occurs. A surprising amount of energy is released by the reactants, and in the process, their atoms and molecules rapidly rearrange to form the products carbon dioxide, water, and potassium chloride. The reaction is said to be product favored. When my son was young, he busted into this container of gummy bears and he ate a whole bunch of them. And man, he was running around the house there for a while, all this sugar energy through him. But after a while then, he crashed because this is like short term kind of thing. And maybe you've experienced something like that. Maybe you haven't if you're better than him and me, let's be honest. But anyway, when you eat food, not just gummy bears, you get energy out. That's why we do it. Now, this is potassium chlorate, which is what we used in the KCLO3 lab a couple weeks ago. It's great about turning the sugar in the gummy bear into energy. And you can see there's a lot of energy. There's kind of a purple color that comes from the potassium, uh, which is kind of cool. But again, this is where the energy component of a reaction really happens. Now, in the net ionics labs, some of you felt the warmth from some of those reactions, and that's really cool. Uh, those reactions do give off some energy. This is just like energy on steroids, if you will. So the need to know if energy comes off or if you need to add energy is a component of seeing if your reaction's gonna go. So this thermal chemistry or thermodynamics is literally just the study of energy exchange. Like when reactions like this massive gummy bear, wow, that's a huge gummy bear, but anyway, uh, a massive reaction, you wanna know how much energy comes off, or if you want this reaction to go and it takes energy, how much energy do you have to put in to make it happen? So this is a different kind of uh, type of science of chemistry, but it is something that's just as important as grams, moles, moles, grams. It's just as kind of a player in the background. So when people think about reactions, when chemists think about reactions, they wanna know like what makes them happen? How do they occur? Do they occur? How fast are they? How slow are they? These are some fundamental questions about science that, and chemistry that everybody should act. Now, if you wanna know why some reactions happen and why some reactions don't, that's where thermodynamics picks in. And that's what we're gonna study in this chapter five section. We're gonna try and look at if reactions occur or if they don't. And I'll use this kind of thumbs up versus thumbs down thing. Thumbs up, thermodynamics says, yes, this is gonna occur. Thumbs down, reactions not scheduled to occur. But it's also nice to know if the reaction is fast or slow because we are human beings, not only are we impatient, <laughs> well, at least I am, but anyway, it's also nice to know if it's gonna be happening in our lifetime. Some reactions are glacially slow. They're incredibly slow, but they will happen. Others, of course, like the gummy bear, go really fast. 
So kinetics is another field of study, and it talks about how fast or slow reactions go. We'll look at kinetics in Chem 222, all right? But I want to talk about it because all we're going to talk about in this section is if the reaction occurs or if it doesn't occur. If we may get a thumbs up and it's going to be so slow, it's going to be our children's, children's, children's job to see that it actually goes forward. Uh, those are the kind of things we're going to talk about. So kinetics will tell how fast or slow it is. Thermodynamics says if it's going to occur or if it's not going to. Thermodynamics determines whether or not a reaction is possible. A reaction that is not thermodynamically favored will not occur to an appreciable extent. Sand is not thermodynamically favored to change into elemental silicon and oxygen, and if undisturbed, no reaction will occur. Turning carbon dioxide back into carbon and oxygen is tough, and that's why it's been tough to get rid of greenhouse gases just like that. Sand, which is the silicon oxide form, going back to silicon and oxygen is even tougher. So thermodynamics gives us a big thumbs down. It's not a reaction which is likely to go. And you can wait until the end of eternity, at least according to thermodynamics, nothing's gonna happen. Reactions that are favored both kinetically and thermodynamically do occur. Paper, for example, will burn quickly in air if ignited. Now you take a torch to a piece of paper, bam, that thing is gone, all right? So this is an example where thermodynamics says, yes, your paper will burn if you give it some flame, all right? Kinetics also says, hey, this is gonna be a fast reaction, all right? You don't have to wait a year or anything like that. It's gonna happen in seconds. So this one gets a thumbs up from both thermodynamics and kinetics. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen fast. This one, though, thermodynamics says, no, I don't think so. That would be incredibly difficult. I hate to say impossible, but it would be incredibly difficult to make that breakdown. Kinetics controls the rate of a chemical reaction. Even if a reaction is thermodynamically favored, if it is not also kinetically favored, it will not occur in an observable time scale. Diamonds are thermodynamically favored to turn into graphite, but the reaction is so slow, it never occurs. If any of you are aware Some reactions take more time than others. Iron nails react with oxygen slowly, producing rust over a period of months. If any of you have diamond earrings, rings, this kind of stuff on you, sorry gang, but diamonds are going to break down to graphite. And graphite is pencil lead, all right? It's like what you use in pencils. And of course, pencil lead, very, very cheap. Diamonds, very, very expensive. But don't go running to the hawk shops, all right? Because kinetics makes this reaction so slow. So here's the thing. Diamonds to graphite gets a thumbs up. It's going to happen, all right? But before you go selling your diamonds, Kinetics makes this reaction so slow that your children's children's children will still be able to enjoy your diamonds should you go there. It's a really slow process. So this is why thermodynamics and kinetics are important. Now, you leave an iron nail out, it's going to rust probably overnight. Maybe not this much, but a little bit. This is another reaction which gets a thumbs up. Something has happened. Can that thermodynamics says it's going to go. This is faster than diamond going to graphite. Not as fast, but faster. Yeah, Gabriel. So if you had one piece of diamond and you broke it into like hundreds of pieces, would the kinetics dictate that it would to devolve into graphite faster? No. Um, it would be uh, based on quantity. All right. And we'll talk about this in Chem 222. But in theory, your little pieces should go the same. Now, if you can react them, that's a different story. And then your little pieces would go better. But this is just leaving your diamonds by themselves. After a while, they'll break down. And it just is based on grams and stuff more than anything. Yeah, Dan. So when it says that it's thermodynamically favored to break down, that means that just the ambient energy from oxygen just in the air is enough to break it down over that time? Yeah. Or does it have to be acted upon continuously over that time for it to break down? No, just natural. It's uh, it's it's kind of like a radioactive isotope would be a better example. You just let it sit there and stuff. Now, you could slow it down even more by changing the temperature, and we'll talk about that in Chem 222. But yeah, but just having these things sit there, going to happen. 
Yeah. What if you could like completely like vacuum seal it and like separate from the oxygen and isolate it? Again, it's all about temperature more than anything, man. So yeah, so you can put it in a vacuum, you can put it in space and stuff. Uh, it's going to happen. If you slow it, you can slow it down with temperature, but that's it. We'll talk more about this in Chem 222, but I want you to start thinking about it because this is something that people don't usually think about. Again, don't be selling your diamonds. <laughs> I had one time one student like, oh my God, no, 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 don't do that. But it is an example of reaction that's going to occur, but it's really slow and stuff. It's kind of, kind of fascinating. So in this section, to figure out when a reaction occurs or when a reaction doesn't occur, there are some indicators that usually mean the reaction should be likely. And we've seen some of these in the net ionics lab. If you form a precipitate, you make a gas, water forms, those are things that usually give you a thumbs up. Those reactions are going to occur. We don't know how fast they're going to occur, but they will occur. And that's why we studied precipitation reactions, gas forming reactions, acid base reactions, even combustion reactions have gas forming, so that's another form and stuff. There are some other ways. Um, electron transfer is really important. We um, talked about redox reaction when you have things oxidized and reduced. Certain types of electron transfer reactions certainly will break down uh, too. So, all of these uh, types of reaction have one thing in common. And if you can transfer energy from the inside to the outside, from the reactants to the outside, the atmosphere solvent, that usually is a pretty good indication that that reaction is going to occur, that's product favorite. And a guy named Boltzmann came up with that. We'll talk about Boltzmann in Chem 223. But just uh, all of these reactions have that in common. They're basically taking a concentrated energy source like a gummy bear and distributing the energy over an air bigger area like your body. So <clears throat> conservation of energy is one of the big laws of physical science. So that would be physics, chemistry, biology. It also affects though uh, geology and all the other sciences and stuff as well. But in the conservation of energy, all right, the total energy is not changed, all right? So the energy you start with equals the energy that you end up with. So in chemistry, the total energy is unchanged when reactants go to products. And that can be graphite to diamond or diamond to graphite. It could be burning paper or gummy bears, anything you want. Now there's two forms of energy that physical scientists get really uh, worked up about and get really interested in. Uh, and those, those types of energy are called heat and work. Now in physics, you'll talk about this a lot more, all right? Work is basically chemicals' ability to move objects, all right? And this is more something that physicists work on. Um, w is the symbol for work. Chemists are usually, though, more interested in the heat, the heat energy being transferred. And heat gets the symbol Q. So sometimes the first law of thermodynamics, which is what conservation of energy is all about, delta E equals Q plus W. That says that the total energy of the system is going to equal the heat plus the work. And this is change of energy. It's going to be zero. You're not gaining or losing any energy. Uh, what would work be measured as? We're not going to talk about a lot of work. That's more for physics, all right? But we'll talk about the units of work here in just a little bit, Ben. So hang tight. Good. I'm going to tease you a little bit on this. We're, we're opening up a big can of worms here, and we're going to basically spend the rest of this year uh, talking about it all the way through Chem 223. So I love the enthusiasm, but I will tease you a little bit here. Dynamics. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It only changes states. This is from Star Trek Discovery. Yeah, chemistry. And you don't have to like Star Trek to do well in this class. Anyway, let's talk about the units of energy and then work, like Ben said. And this guy, Jewel, who I think has the coolest beard of all the scientists I show, came up with the idea of what's called a calorie. 
And calorie, which is given the symbol little c, that'll be important here in a little bit, cal. One calorie is the heat required to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius, all right? And for a long time, the calorie was kind of the way that things did. Um, people started to call this version of the calorie the science calorie because you've probably seen on the back of food and drinks and stuff like that how much calories you're consuming. Well, a food calorie technically gets a capital C and a food calorie is equal to a thousand science calories or a kilocalorie. Uh, food in Australia and stuff like that is usually listed as kilocals instead of the big C calorie. So you can probably see that there's some confusion. So if you have uh, three grams, three calories that you consume in a piece of chocolate, that's going to be food calories. That would be that times a thousand. That would be 3,000 science calories. So science calories and food calories are really easy to get confused. So instead of talking about that, and this now answers what Ben was asking just a second ago, we're going to talk about what's called the joule. And a joule is a unit of energy, all right? It's used, we're going to use it for heat, all right, because that's where chemists go, but it does work for work as well. The joule is related to a science calorie. 4.184 joules equals a science calorie. 4.184 is a number we're going to use a lot. So make sure you know, slash memorize, slash put on your worksheet, whatever. Don't make a tattoo of it, okay? But anyway, short of those kind of things, 4.184 is going to have lots of uses for it. So a science calorie, small c. Food calorie, big c. But we're going to use the joule, which gets a capital J for a piece. You can have a kilojoule, which is a thousand joules. All of these kind of things are totally possible. Now, in addition, with energy, you have to know if the energy is, if you will, active energy or energy that is inside something ready to be released. And so we're going to talk here about potential energy, which is the energy inside something ready to be released, and kinetic energy, which is active energy. This is a picture of a bungee jumper, and uh, this isn't, uh, I saw this, uh, there's that one bridge kind of by Redmond, and I was there the other day, and they had these people that were going to bungee jump off, and I was like, wow, this isn't one of those people, but um, you can imagine that if this person's going to bungee jump, there's like a big gap down here, and this little rope holds onto them as they bounce back and forth. The bungee jumper on the edge of that platform has huge amounts of potential energy. One step and they start really going crazy. Well, in chemistry, you can have potential energy too. It's not as cool as bungee jumping. But these, the potential energy is energy stored inside the bonds. So sodium chloride, the uh, ionic version with alternating sodium chloride, sodium chlorides has a lot of this kind of energy inside. This is electrostatic positives, negatives, and there's quite a bit of energy stored inside those bonds. Now you can also have gravitational potential energy. This is more of a gravitational energy because when the bungee jumper jumps, the gravity pulls them down and then it goes back and forth. You can have nuclear energy. So if you have a uranium-235 sample or something, that'll have lots of energy inside it. So potential energy is the energy that's ready to rock and roll, but it's not, hasn't been used yet, okay? Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. It's active energy. So once that bungee jumper takes the step over and they start going down, that's when the potential energy is turned into kinetic energy. Now in chemistry, there's three types of energy of movement which are super important. One of them is called translational, all right? And translational is literally the movement. So pretend I'm a water molecule and I'm moving, all right? This is translational energy, all right? It's some kind of energy you can actually see. You can describe translational energy from physics one half mv squared. If you've taken physics before, it might be familiar. If it's not, mass is just how much grams or kilograms you've got. Velocity is usually a speed, like meters per second. 
and you can calculate this number. This would be a joule number, going back to what Ben asked about earlier. It would tell you how much energy you've got. But in chemistry, we also like to do vibrations, vibrational energy. Now in this molecule, notice how the carbons and hydrogens, they're kind of doing this kind of thing, <laughs> all right? So not only are the molecules moving relative to each other, but they also have vibration energy. And this is another form of energy which is really important to chemists. But on top of that, you have rotational energy. So if I'm a water molecule, I am constantly doing this kind of thing, all right? I have to, I'm moving, like X to Y, something like that. I'm rotating, getting myself dizzy, and I am vibrating. The little bonds are going back and forth. All three of these contribute to the kinetic energy of the molecule. Temperature absolutely affects it, all right? So that's why if you want to slow down your diamonds to graphite conversion, you put it in a really cold temperature, it will slow it down. You have to do it, of course, for lots and lots of years and stuff, but it is dependent on temperature, because you can imagine molecules, just like me, wouldn't move around as well in colder temperatures versus warmer temperatures. In energy, there's one more concept we gotta think about, and that's what they call system versus surroundings. Now, the system is what you're studying. It's the place where the action happens. So in this example right here, hydrogen and oxygen are inside. They're the system, and that means they're gonna probably turn into water here a little bit. So the system is the stuff creating the change of energy, all right? So for us in chemistry, that would be the reactants, all right? They're gonna be the system, but it wouldn't be necessarily the solvent. Solvent's usually more just getting the reactants together. The surroundings are everything outside of the system. So that's where the energy will happen. If you have energy being given off, then the energy goes to the system. On the other hand, if you have some reactions, energy has to go from the system to the, to the reactants, to the system. So surroundings are usually the solvent, all right, which a lot of times for us is water. It can be the air. It's everything that's not making a change of chemistry. So when you eat a gummy bear, all right, the sugar is dissolved, some kind of protein or something, the rest of our body is the surroundings, all right? The system would be the gummy bear and whatever is breaking down the sugar in our stomachs. The surroundings would be everything else, so the blood and the tissue and the water and stuff associated. Um, we'll talk about why system and surroundings are important. Just realize that they're both part of an energy thing. Surroundings usually either absorb the energy coming out of the system, or once in a while they'll donate energy to the system to make reactions happen. Now, why system and surrounding is so important is that knowing how energy flows is really important. Uh, you need to know if the energy is coming out of the system or going into the system. So let's first talk about what we saw, some of us anyway, on the Net Ionics Lab on Monday. And when you felt the little test tube, it was warm. That's because the system, whatever those chemicals were, those reactants, when they came together, energy was released. So an exothermic reaction means that the reactants are giving off energy, all right? The energy is being created by the reactants, it's being released. You'll see like lots of pop smoke coming off, you'll see solids happening, whatever. But the important thing here is that if you, because we're always looking more at the surroundings than the system, it's going to get warmer. If you feel a reaction getting warmer, that means the system is giving up energy to the surroundings. So we measure the heat of the outside, the surroundings, but that heat has to come from somewhere, it comes from the system, the exciting parts. So like acids and bases, especially strong acids, bases, you put them together, lots of energy is released, all right? It's the acid and the base, which are the system. They create water, creating energy, which goes to the surroundings. We feel it getting warm, 
your temperature would go up. If you put a thermometer in there, it's going to get warmer. So exothermic means system is going to surroundings, energy is being released, and you will feel it getting warmer. Questions on that? All right. Once in a while, the opposite happens too. And in these systems, the system needs energy from the surroundings to make it happen. And uh, Daniel says, here you go, Russell, it's been a long week. Here's a cold uh, pot soft drink. <laughs> Just say no, kids. Anyway, I, he's got some ice in there, but oh, I get distracted because I'm already spacey as it is. And the ice melts. <laughs> All right, darn it. Oh, man, I was still looking forward to that drink that Daniel made. Anyway, stupid example, but ice melting doesn't happen without energy. All right, you've got to add the energy into the ice to make those solid bonds break and become liquid water. So this is an example where the surroundings are giving up their energy to the system. And it melt, helps to melt the ice. If you were to feel it or put a thermometer in there, your temperature would go down. It would feel cold, all right? Now, more reactions that we are acknowledging anyway are exothermic than endothermic. But endothermic, when energy goes from the outside to the inside, is also really important. So again, most of the time, system to surroundings, exothermic, feel it get warm, temperature goes up if you have a thermometer. But endothermic, the outside gives energy to the inside. The system uh, takes energy from the surroundings. Your temperature will go down. It feels colder, all right? And even if the ice melts in my drink, I could still drink it. It would still be cold. It just won't be as cold as when the ice was there. So what we have now is a good basis to start talking about energy, all right? Joules are the unit we're gonna use. Exothermic, energy is released. It feels warmer, temperature goes up. Endothermic, energy has to be absorbed from the outside to the inside. The temperature will actually go down. The system is what's releasing energy, exo, or absorbing energy, endo. The surroundings is everything around. All right, solvent, air, whatever happens to be there. So here's a reaction. We do it, and it feels warm upon completion. It's like, oh, man, there's some heat being generated. Is this reaction exothermic, endothermic, neither? Or do we need more information to do it? What do you think? Exo, that's abs absolutely. If it feels warm, that means that energy has been released. That's exothermic. Exothermic reactions are usually more fun. Explosions, fire, <laughs> all right, stuff like that. Um, acids and bases, uh, these kind of things. Endothermic will have its purpose too, don't get me wrong, but exothermic uh, are the ones you can usually notice that something's happening. All right, now, for whatever reason, uh, and you'll learn about this in physics or higher levels of chemistry, it makes a difference if your heat, Q, is being transferred at constant pressure or constant volume. And this is a scary subject to me. Oh, I didn't like this subject, but it doesn't matter. Because in our Chem 221 through Chem 223 class, we almost always do things at regular atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere. So all of our measurements in the Chem 200 series are heat being transferred at constant pressure. And this has a fancy name. It's called enthalpy. And enthalpy is kind of the way that chemists usually require and record energy being transferred. And there's lots of different versions of enthalpy. Enthalpy gets the symbol delta H. There's delta H of vaporization. This is delta H of formation we'll talk about. Those are specific types of enthalpy. But as long as you have constant pressure, which is everything in Chem 221 through Chem 223, you're good. Now, check these signs out. If delta H is less than zero, if it's a negative number, that means bam, energy is released by the system to the surroundings, delta H is less than zero exothermic. 
On the other hand, if it's a positive delta H, if the delta H is greater than zero, then energy is absorbed from the outside to the inside. Those are endothermic. So just like pH will quickly tell you if it's acid or base, the sign of delta H will tell you if it's exo or endo. Negative exo, positive endothermic. Same thing applies to Q too. If you have a Q value that's negative, it's exo. Q values that are positive or endo. Now, back to the first law of thermodynamics. Total energy equals heat plus work. You can substitute in, in our Chem 200 classes, the heat is enthalpy. And because the work is usually not around in chemistry, the pressure is constant, so QP is good. That means that the energy can usually be measured through just the enthalpy. And that's why the chemists get so crazy about enthalpy. Now in physics and those kind of classes, you'll talk about other kinds of pieces and the work component is certainly important. But for us in chemistry, pressure is usually constant. And if you measure the enthalpy, that's almost always, almost exactly equal to the energy change itself. And that's why it's kind of cool. So you don't have to worry about work, don't have to worry about weird volume changes and stuff. Questions? All right, so the enthalpy of reaction is literally just a number with joules, kilojoules, stuff like that. And it can be measured in different ways. The numbers are usually pretty big when it's just joules. So it's very common to see energies listed as kilojoules per mole. Now, earlier I showed some slides, uh, in, uh, I think before the first midterm, and there was some hydrogen gas in the inside, oxygen on the outside. You put a little flame next to it, bam, some energy comes off and water is formed. We can represent that in diagrams like this. So this is an enthalpy axis, all right? So it gets more positive going this way and more negative going this way. The reactants, hydrogen and oxygen, are at, if you will, a higher enthalpy, while water is at a lower enthalpy. So going from reactants to the products, you can see you're going down. The enthalpy will be a number less than zero. And that's one way that chemists think about if a reaction is endo or exothermic. In this one, we're going down in energy. It's gonna have a negative delta H value, exothermic. What do you think the value would be if you took water as a gas and you made hydrogen and oxygen for it? Do you think it would be a positive number or a negative number? Positive. And this, my friends, is an important part about thermodynamics. In this reaction as written, reactants to products, exothermic, negative. If you go the opposite direction, if you go from water to hydrogen and oxygen, you can see the arrow would go back up this way. It would be just as positive as the other reaction was negative. So if this was say 10 kil negative 10 kilojoules going down, it would be positive 10 kilojoules going up. And thermodynamics, this is really important. Positive one direction, equal but opposite sign in the opposite direction. This is something you'll see a lot in thermodynamics. Now, this is what I'm trying to explain right here. This is a reaction, a combustion reaction, where methane and oxygen are making water and CO2. Combustion reactions almost always exothermic. So reactants to products, it's going down negative 890 kilojoules. If you wanted to make CO2 and water turn back into methane and oxygen, which would be tough, but let's say it's possible, you would have the equal but opposite sign. So products to reactants, the reverse reaction would be positive 890 kilojoules. It's literally the opposite of what it was in the other direction. So if you flip a reaction in thermodynamics, you just change the sign. Same magnitude, but positive versus negative. Calorimetry is how scientists measure these kind of numbers, all right? And not next Monday's lab, but the Monday after that is our calorimetry lab. 
Um, the ultimate way to measure calorimetry is through what's called a bomb calorimeter. Uh, we won't use a bomb calorimeter, but we'll use something similar and stuff to measure how much energy goes in and out and stuff like that. So, questions? Heat, or thermal energy, is associated with the motions of atoms and molecules in a substance. The more rapid these atomic scale motions, the greater a substance's thermal energy and the hotter it is. When we plunge a hot metal bar into cool water, thermal energy from the bar transfers to the water. While the atoms and molecules of the bar slow down, those of the water speed up. The transfer of energy can be measured as a rise in water molecules temperature. Molecules of a hot substance move more rapidly than those of the same substance with a lower temperature. If the two samples come in contact, a transfer of molecular momentum occurs from the rapidly moving molecules to the slower ones. In this way, thermal energy transfers from the hotter sample to the cooler one. When the two samples have similar rates of molecular motion, they have reached thermal equilibrium and have the same temperature. One thing that's really important about uh, thermodynamics is that and all examples ever studied, if you take something hot and you place something cold with it, the hot and the cold go warm. And there are no examples of like the hot getting hotter and the cold getting colder. Hot and cold always make warm. So in the video on the right there, you had the red hot and the blue cold. They came together to make kind of a purple color, which is in between. And this is one of the big ideas of the kinetic molecular theory. We talked about in uh, chapter two, part one, how solids are very rigid, liquids are flexible, but some bonds and gases have no bonds. That was kinetic molecular theory as well. So thermal equilibrium just means that the hot and the cold have come together to make warm. Like the warm piece of metal and the cold water made some kind of in-between temperature. If you've ever seen this thing, and I don't encourage anybody to slap anyone, however, poor, poor Robin, he says, you know, close the window, you're letting the cold in. No, it's all about the heat, man. <laughs> the heat is going out, the cold is not coming in. So anyway, if you want to get me riled up, but anyway, don't, don't get each other, please, I'm a pacifist. Anyway, so in uh, hot and cold, all right, if low, hot, low temperature, hot temperature comes together, everything ends up at the same warm temperature. All right, and so we can actually use this to study systems. And we're gonna use it studying this equation right here. Q equals MC delta T. Now Q is nothing more than the joules, all right? The actual numbers we're gonna calculate here in a little bit. M is usually a mass in grams. C is what they call the heat capacity or specific heat or specific heat capacity. They're all the same things. Every substance has its own ability to go up in temperature or down, and that's what the C is. And delta T is the change in the temperature. So I'll leave off with this slide right here. This is the first big equation for chapter five. It's how you can figure out how much heat is being transferred with no phase change. So you're not changing the ice to liquid water. You're not taking steam and turning it into a solid. Q is literally just the heat, and heat is positive when it's endothermic, and negative when it's exothermic. M usually is in grams. It's how many grams of material you have. C is interesting. It's called a specific heat capacity, and it relates to how fast substances heat up and cool down. You may have heard that metals heat up and cool down faster than like water. This is related through the specific heat capacity. And the most interesting one here, I think, is what's called delta T. Now we're gonna start seeing a lot of deltas in science. Delta means final minus initial. So in this category, it's a delta temperature. It would be the final temperature minus the initial temperature. And what's really crazy is that delta T can be Kelvin or Celsius. So as an example, let's say you have uh, liquid water at, one, at zero degrees and you heated it to almost the steam at 100 degrees. Well, delta T would be 100 minus zero, delta T would be 100. In Kelvin, this would be 273.15 to 273.15. 
to 373.15. And so delta T, 373 minus 273, 100. Delta T, you can use Celsius or Kelvin, whatever is easier. And it doesn't matter, you'll get the same number. And this is why scientists love to use Celsius and Kelvin, because you can interchange them. Technically, it's supposed to be Kelvin, but the delta T is the same number. So again, don't use Fahrenheit, <laughs> all right? I hope that's obvious. But as long as you're using Celsius or Kelvin, throw them in that equation. Good to go. Any questions? All right. We'll do more of this on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for being here. Have a great day.